Okay, class, this is Dr. Severin, and this is pulmonary pathophysiology. So um, we've broken up this series of lectures into two primary parts, uh, chronic and acute. Um, it just makes a little bit more sense to break things up this way. The pathophysiological manifestations of chronic conditions and acute conditions are a little bit, uh, a little bit different, as you'll see kind of as we go. So. Uh, the objectives for today, uh, or for this lecture, are to demonstrate and comprehend the major differences between some of these uh, major pulmonary pathologies, and we'll go over in, like, some differences in clinical presentation, diagnostic imaging, and then the physiological uh, ramifications, and then overall how that impacts movement. So uh, before we kind of dive into specifics, I really do want to uh, acknowledge how severe um, or how significant respiratory disease is in terms of mortality. Um, these are figures from the CDC from 2013. Uh, however, the data is still pretty consistent that chronic respiratory disease um, still is our third leading killer, right? It still comes in um, at number three, you know, above things that we often associate, you know, with mortality, diabetes, stroke, stuff like that, like chronic you know, lower respiratory disease uh, being a leading cause of mortality. And really, if you group in uh, influenza and uh, pneumonias um, into that as well, it really kind of paints a picture of uh, how much uh, lung disease uh, impacts our healthcare system uh, overall. And this will, co of course, vary um, in different parts of the world, um, you know, and we'll, we'll kind of uh, touch more on this as we go. So uh, I do want to reiterate, again, factors that af affect the work of breathing or forces that affect the work of breathing. Again, the elastic recoil forces of the lung and chest wall, again, uh, the lung have a, t have a tendency to want to pull in due to their uh, elastic particles or elast elastin mo uh, molecules contained within them. Again, the lung's 30% elastin by uh, weight, um, as well as the surface tension in the alveoli. The chest wall tends to want to pull outward, right? And then anytime that that's affected, that's going to affect how you know, the work of, breathe, of breathing imposed upon the respiratory muscles. To assess this, we typically use a value called static lung compliance, which is a change in volume uh, for any given applied pressure. And we're really talking about the respiratory muscles here. So generally, um, we're looking at the change in volume corresponding to the necessary change in pressure. Now, compliance in the lung will increase with age um, and, and with COPD. We lose some of the elastin, uh, or the elastin kind of breaks down, similar to other tissue that, have, you know, that, that changes as we age, um, and it decreases um, with restrictive lung disease, meaning that's harder, right, compliance, the lungs are less compliant in a restrictive disease. And we'll get over like, what that even entails in a bit. Uh, so again, lung compliance, they get a little bit easier to stretch um, or to change their volume um, at a set pressure with age. They're a little bit easier to stretch. And the, they decrease um, when we have restrictive or fibrotic lung diseases. And then the other would be airway resistance, right? And we said a big component of that is bronchoconstriction, how open or how constricted or narrowed uh, the airways are, as well as uh, there can be other things that affect airway resistance, like mucus plugs, which we see in certain conditions like chronic bronchitis, cystic fibrosis, stuff like that, and then airway thickening in fibrosis. And there's a several conditions that we see this occurring. So again, just a reiteration again of what like what makes breathing more challenging, sorry, elastic recoil forces, and then airway resistance. And again, airway resistance providing the bulk of that of that work. So in terms of pulmonary pathologies, these are the ones that we're going to cover in this course. Again, there's you know multitudes of different um, subclassifications for different conditions. Uh, we're going to focus in this lecture on the chronic cases or these series of lectures um, with an emphasis on obstructive defects, restrictive defects, pulmonary hypertension, and then lung cancer. And in the following lecture, we'll cover our acute lecture, our acute conditions. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but we're going to cover some of the major ones, the stuff that you'll see in clinic um, you know, or clinical practice. So uh, chronic pulmonary conditions. So um, I do want to emphasize uh, that there are some general kind of sequelae, right, or secondary complications that we often see as a result of chronic lung disease. 
pulmonary hypertension being a big one. If we're not able to really effectively exchange gases and we're holding on to more CO2, we're not effectively clearing or taking on O2, remembering that the vasculature in the pulmonary circulation is a little bit different than the periphery. In the periphery, CO2 is a vasodilator um, and O2 um, vasoconstrictor, right? Um, however, in the lungs, a little bit different. CO2 in the lungs is a vasoconstrictor and oxygen is a vasodilator. That's why giving um, quite often oxygen supplementation to patients with pulmonary hypertension can be effective um, because of the, the vasodilatory um, effects of oxygen in the pulmonary vasculature. Um, again, if we, you know, thinking of that whip and last and gas exchange gear, quite often, you know, especially if we develop pulmonary hypertension with a lung disease that loads the right side of the heart, the right ventricle really is after load sensitive. It does not tolerate increases in demand. It fails a, you know, a little bit, e a little bit sooner, a little bit easier than the left side because, you know, the, the ventricular walls are very thin. If we see right heart failure due to a left, left or sorry, due to a lung disease, we refer to that as core pulmonal. So right heart failure due to a chronic lung condition. Um, we often see atrial fibrillation, uh, especially in cases of COPD. We think there may be some inflammatory changes that mediate this. It could also be due to some of the remodeling that occurs with right heart failure potentially due to that pulmonary hypertension. We often see occurring concomitantly or as a sequelae of chronic lung disease. So AFib is quite prevalent um, in, in certain populations, as well as obstructive sleep apnea, and especially in COPD. Um, but we'll talk more about what that even, in, even entails in a bit. Now, I do want to comment a little bit on digital clubbing. Um, so clubbing is something we absolutely can see with chronic lung disease. And in lung disease, we're not um, thinking, you know, cancer per se. However, the most common cause of, um, of digital clubbing actually, in fact, is lung cancer, primary lung cancer. Um, so again, you know, we can see it in chronic lung disease. It is more associated um, with uh, lung cancer. It's actually the most common cause of, um, of digital clubbing. We think it may have to do with, you know, changes in oxygenation in the blood or even just perfusion to the limbs. Uh, however, um, you know, it is uh, more, again, more commonly occurring in lung cancer. And of course, digital clubbing is just, um, we see a geometrical change in the angle of the, um, of the nails in the fingernails, where they become almost a little bit more bulbous and the angle is a little, a little bit um, sharper than, than it would be typically. Now, the first series of conditions we're gonna talk about are obstructive pulmonary diseases, okay? Now, there are two general classifications of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases or these, uh, these obstructive pulmonary diseases. So we have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, um, which includes chronic bronchitis, emphysema, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is a type of or develops a type of emphysema. We'll talk about what that means in a bit. And then asthma is technically grouped in there as well. Um, you know, it does result in a uh, defect, um, an obstructive defect. We'll talk about what that entails in the next slide. I, I struggle sometimes with putting this in the same grouping because the clinical manifestations of asthma are very different, but it is an obstructive pulmonary disease that are, is chronic. Again, occur, occur, typically occurs in childhood, so people have it for a long time. But when we're often referring to COPD, um, you know, Asthma, I, you know, it's not exactly the same thing, and we'll, we'll kind of go over like why why this matters in a bit. And then there are septic obstructive diseases, so bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis. Uh, bronchiectasis can also be uh, an acute change. Um, we can also see chronic uh, bronchiectasis, and we'll go over what that entails. Uh, bronchiectasis usually occurs secondary to another condition like cystic fibrosis, um, and septic obstructive diseases are, you know, in, again. You can throw them possibly under the category of COPD if you if you wanted to, but they're a little bit different because they're they're they're, they're more uh, their hallmark sign is really this productive and excessive secretion and mucus production, this purulent sputum 
um, and really high incidence of infection, which is, again, it's a little bit different than when we think of COPD in the classic sense. Um, so again, uh, we're gonna break this down for this lecture um, with these three really falling um, within COPD and asthma kind of being its own separate thing, um, and then septic obstructive uh, diseases. Um, it's important to note that you know even within the subgrouping of COPD, you know, we have these you know subdiagnoses you know or, or subtypes. Um, realistically, just like heart failure, quite often patients with COPD have all three concomitantly present. Um, it's just that you know one's expressed a little bit more than the other. Some patients have more of a chronic bronchitis presentation uh, than they do an emphysatic presentation. They maybe have a little bit of asthma occurring concomitantly as well. Now, when we're thinking about obstructive pulmonary diseases, you, you really need to think of problems getting air out of the lungs. If you can remember that, it'll make everything a little bit easier when we start going over the differences in PFTs and different things that happen um, within these different conditions. Um, again, normally our FEV1, FVC ratio is gonna be 0.8, okay? However, in someone with a um, obstructive defect, it's gonna be below 0.7. This means that they really struggle with um, their FEV1. Their FEV1s are typically below 80% of, of, of normal. So, you know, uh, so if we have a lower FEV1, right, it's gonna make this ratio a little bit smaller, okay? Um, and typically with an a COPD, again, this is where things get a little bit different um, than asthma, um, you know, they're unresponsive to a bronchodilator. A patient with asthma, um, this defect would be present, this, you know, lower FEV1 ratio, but they would respond well to a bronchodilator almost immediately, it'd be reversible. Uh, they typically have an increased airway compliance. We're thinking again, emphysema, chronic bronchitis here. The lungs are a little bit, um, you know, get easier to stretch, right? And we, because of that, we also see force coupling change. And we'll go over like what, what, what manifests due to that, okay? Um, it's defined as a preventable and, and treatable disease. Um, again, you know, we think that we know for pretty preconclusively that the most common risk factor for COPD is smoking or really any repeated exposure um, to noxious particulate or debris and smoking tobacco is the leading one. In other countries and developing nations where there's more coal production or coal utilization for energy and manufacturing, you might see biomass fueling be the top or, or different vapors or air pollution. Um, China comes, comes, uh, comes a name here, They're really poor air quality there. And again, what we end up seeing again is this persistent airflow limitation. And it's really talking about the issues getting air out, which again is um, hallmarked by a reduction in FEV1, that volume that comes out during that forced vital capacity maneuver in that first second. They really struggle with that. It's really low. Now, again, looking at our types, um, asthma, again, it's, it's, we see an obstructive defect due to bronchospasm. Um, but it's reversible. So if we give patients a bronchodilator, right, something you need to dilate their, their airways, um, it resolves, okay? It's typically manifesting much earlier in life. Uh, emphysema and chronic bronchitis, which are our two kind of primary types of COPD, they occur much later in life, like past the fifth decade. Um, so a little bit different. So asthma typically occurring in kids associated with wheezing and this reversible bronchospasm. That's the, that's the big ticket here is reversible bronchospasm. Whereas emphysema and chronic bronchitis manifest much later in life and they are, um, you know, it's not a reversible change. It's damage to some component of the, of the lungs. Emphysema, we see damage to the distal and uh, we see damage to structures distal to terminal bronchioles or acinar airways, also known as the acinus, okay? which includes like respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, and we see a loss of alveolar walls and loss of alveolar surface area for exchange. We'll, we'll go over what that looks like in a bit. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, we'll speak specifically about that. That's a genetic deficiency, uh, which can be exacerbated by cigarette smoking, 
um, but it's a little bit different. So it's a genetic cause of emphysema, and we'll go over that specifically. Chronic bronchitis um, is a the presence of a cough and sputum production, um, not due to a localized disease like an infection or something specific, um, and it's present for at least more than three months per year for two consecutive years. And we'll go over the clinical manifestations of that in, in a bit. So again, going over our primary groupings, again, we have our you know, obstructive pulmonary diseases, thinking about problems getting air out, Note, you know, most notified or, or, or diagnosed by a FEV1 to FEC ratio less than 0.7. And, you know, again, really where FEV1 is taking the big hit. And then we have our subgroupings, emphysema, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and then asthma. You can throw in there, but again, when people refer to COPD, it's typically not referring to asthma. And then we have septic obstructive diseases like bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis. So in the next lecture, we're going to go over these specific conditions um, and how they manifest um, and how their pathophysiology develops.